Okay, so we're on the air. Welcome to Dive into World Building. This week's topic is hobbies and crafts. And I, I was realizing when I set up the topic that it sounded very lighthearted because I think one of the things that we often miss about crafts is that they're vital to a lot of economies and uh, and they are a really huge part of life especially in uh, worlds and where technology is not at the same level that it is in our world right now so um, you know for example the other day when we were talking about economics uh, somebody brought up the uh, the issue of this special women's economy where the women would actually create rubbings on leaves. Was that you, Glenda? can't remember no, now. No, I don't know who brought that up. Uh, uh, faulty memory. But anyway, it was really, really cool. And one of the things about these, these leaves is that they thereafter functioned as a special form of currency that you could trade for things. And that was really, really cool because it took a while to make these. It wasn't like people had tons of extra time in their lives to make them. So they had a particular value and and that was really, really cool. And that was ostensibly a craft, right? But um so I think there are there are a lot of um a lot of opportunities that for interesting things that we can talk about here. Well yeah, um, yeah what we would consider craft are hobbies in modern world, things like knitting and weaving and making clothes and Mm -hmm. Those were all vital uh, activities at one time. Yes. There's also an entire craft world of people that go to craft fairs, professional craft fairs. I used to be one of those. Mm -hmm. The scrapbookers alone, those people are crazy in a good way, but it's amazing the whole language you develop. And there are, you know, the maker fairs and the conventions and... Um, so, yeah, absolutely. This is a. I think uh, this is a topic that ha that can cover a lot of ground. Um, so, um, oh, and with with regards to, I mean, there's so much to say. Okay, so um, I was reading Hild uh, recently um, by Nicola Griffith, and they have a lot of portrayal of. The, the women's crafts of textile making and all of that in portrayed in the book and it's clear that these kinds of craft activities um, were absolutely vital to the economy and women spent most of their time doing this it was it was a very serious thing that women did all day long <laughs> you know um, it certainly changes one of the things I think is back to that kind of basic level and you change a value there so you know instead of being spun and woven by machines you have people having to spin and weave suddenly the value of everything that's spun or woven completely changes across the society mm -hmm. and that has all kinds of consequences for the way people use their time uh, for the value of objects, for for social relations, for all kinds of unexpected things, right? Um, Here's one. I remember. Corn husks. See? Sorry. Corn husks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. Sure. Tell me more about corn husks. Well, this is a horseshoe. Um, after I got my car accident, a bunch of people from Renfair sent me goodwill tokens. And I've had this one ever since. I usually hang it over my door for obvious reasons. Um, corn husk dolls mm -hmm. are a very important form of folk art. You can find uh, marrying pairs. This is something that happens more often in like Amish country, although you know that part of the United States. But um, corn husks can be made into some really impressive Celtic knotwork shapes that oh, wow. have a yeah, they have a relationship to the culture the same way the sweater pattern in Irish fishing villages identified yeah. the 
person, the family and the clan of the man who's wearing it if he was lost at sea. So this type of thing represents so much that, as Juliet says, it's more than just time, although time is an essential currency too. This represents identity and culture and this is why souvenirs are so important when you bring mm -hmm. something back from where you've gone. A, you've spent money on the people you love, but B, you've brought that place back to them so they can share in it and appreciate it too. I mean, like you said, Julia, it's a huge topic. <laughs> and actually, yeah. you just reminded me of what's available in a particular location. Mm -hmm. Because when you started talking about Celtic knotwork and corn husks, mm -hmm. I immediately said, thought, oh, that's two different continents. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly, the corn husks were from the Americas and the Celtic knotwork, well, you know, until that traveling happened, they were probably made with something else. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Grasses. Sorry, say that again, Raj? Then we have Persian carpets, which really follow the uh, having a tribal influence in the designs and, and even in the materials. The yeah. Dive. Were they really oh, supposed to be in your gardens? Oh, sorry, Juliet. I don't know. Who else was talking? It wasn't me. I said, are Persian carpets mostly silk? Oh, no. Most no. of them are wool. There are uh -huh. silk ones that come from places like Isfahan and Nain. Um, and those who are, so the designs of those are really gorgeous, but the, the process of making them is so much more difficult because you're dealing with something like 800 to 1200 knots per square inch, uh -huh. as apart from three to 400 from wool. Uh -huh. Well, and then um, and then that has a, a consequence for who has to make the carpets too, because um, you know who has who has the best fingers for tying that many knots per square inch. Women, and typically, children. little children. children. Yep. yep. Women, you know, women and children basically did it, and still do. Yeah, they do. By the way, uh, do you know how they they finish up carpets? Persian carpets, they throw them in the street and let cars run over them. Uh, say more about that? They throw them in the street and let traffic run over them. To, that takes care of the kind of overshininess, then they wash them. <laughs> oh my. Thing. Yeah? I suppose traditionally they let livestock run over them. Or Probably so. <laughs> Livestock, sure. Wagons. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I mean, that makes me think of, it makes me think of threshing and the way that people used to um, process wheat. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's this really wonderful building at um, uh, Mount Vernon where it's a, this octagonal barn that was specially designed by George Washington <laughs> and and what it has is it's it's two stories okay and it has a big earthen ramp that runs up to the uh, to the top floor and then when you go in the floor actually is slats with gaps in between them and so what they would do is they would take the harvested wheat and lay it out across the slats and then they would drive the horses up the ramp and then have the horses trot around this octagonal barn and and basically thresh the wheat that way yeah and, and, I, and then we were told you know the key was that you had to keep the horses moving because uh, <laughs> you just didn't want them to have to go pee. <laughs> so you wanted to make sure that they never stopped because if they did that, they could ruin the weed. <laughs> and I mean, I don't know what, what an interesting thing. This is I mean, the, the things fact I learned that here. Get these things done is such a driver of innovation. It's incredible, right? Wow. You know. Now here's here's I, an interesting thing. 
Yeah. Um, I got a little story for you about the craft world now and how people react to it. The professional uh -huh. crafters that do, you no, know, craft people that do jury shows and things like that. I used to know these people named the Bennetts. They were leather workers. And, you know, we'd have these big booths and people would come in. And one couple came into these people's booths, you know, they're looking all around at all this, this, these leather jackets and, and purses and all this stuff that these people made. And they said, How do you have time to do all this? You must not work. <laughs> nice. Great. Uh, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I think that all of those of us who are writers are familiar with the old uh, saying, oh, how do you find time to write? You must not work. <laughs> right? or, or writing, that's such a great hobby. <laughs> you know? Um, when maybe not, uh, but anyway, uh, back to crafting. <laughs> so uh, I'm thinking about. I have never figured out how my sewing machine works. Um, God, join the club. It's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. <laughs> and I think back at the at the the flying needles of these people who must have made all these clothes. Um, you know, how, how the heck do you invent a sewing machine? I, that, <laughs> that was I don't know. <laughs> but uh, but it's fascinating. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention that a minute ago that I forgot to mention was that when we went to Normandy a couple years ago, uh, we went to the museum in Caen, and they had an amazing display about lace manufacture mm. Mm. and and the way that lace was made in Normandy uh, back in the day and it was unbelievable <laughs> uh, they had you know they had these spindles that were all of this this big you know and they had the this the threads wound around them and then you would have them, you know, tied down at one spot, and then people would just wind the spindles around each other, and you could see like these piles and piles of spindles. I mean, they would have for some of these designs, they would have hundreds of spindles, and you're going, how in the world did they do that and keep track of it? And I mean, the hours that it must have required, just unbelievable. I remember. Looking at that now, there was there was more than one technique, but the spindle one was the one that really blew my mind. Um, there was such is such a change in culture that happened when machines started to be able to create lace. And the thing that really stunned me was that I had been accustomed to looking at all these paintings of these women from the time period when this was going on, you know, wearing these beautiful dresses covered with lace. But my mind was in my own century. You know, I'm thinking, wow, those are beautiful. Wow, that's amazing, whatever. But my mind was still on some level in my own century because it was not until I went to that display two years ago that I realized how many hours of somebody's life went into a single one of these dresses that yes. was being worn by the aristocracy in France. Just Ex unbelievable. Extract and I thought, play of wealth. You're wearing somebody's whole life. You know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's crazy. Their so, eyesight. Um, their arthritis. All of that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. A lot of couture gowns are still made like that. Mm. There's other lace work that's like embroidered on a frame um, that people do the designs on and bead them. And there's only a very few places left in France that do these couture fabrics that go into couture gowns and there are special qualifications for being 
couture um, to begin with. Mm hmm Yeah. So yeah. Side note. <laughs> I just really like it. Well, so yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. The the other thing that that, that makes me think of is the um, silk embroidery in China and Japan, where the you know mm -hmm. where you have these tiny tiny little stitches that create these amazing, um, you know, patterns that don't seem like they're stitched. You know, because the the stitching is so fine. Um, yeah. It's funny you should mention that, Juliet. I've had to research baby clothes in Tokugawa, Japan, just this week for the section I'm on. And what's really fun is I've been looking at the embroidery patterns for kimono. Mm. And I came up with one. I have to learn about seasonal colors and whatnot. I've got a navy blue kimono with maple leaves falling down onto a border at the hem of grasses. And the mm -hmm. more I learn about this, the more I appreciate, like, the women from the Heian period onward spent most of their time, the court ladies, tearing apart their clothes and re-sewing them because of all the 12 underlayers under the main mm -hmm. kimono. And it's just mind-boggling. Like, I I'm sorry, I don't know the lady's name who was talking about the couture dresses. Shay? Hey, hey, yeah. yeah. Hi, how you doing? Hey. Sewing. We take it for granted. I mean, we look at whole clothing now. It's like, you know, buying our food in the supermarket. It's already made, right? So sewing is really occupying my attention lately as far beyond just a craft. It's it's a lifestyle. It really is. It has been for women for so many centuries. Yeah. Um, I have actually, this makes me think, I have um, my host mom uh, in Kyoto works at a thread shop and she's a, so they're, they're basically a thread wholesalers and it's so amazing, so amazing <laughs> to see the kind of thread that comes through their shop because it's the silk kimono thread and um, her mother is a professional crafter and, um, you know, she has so went mad sewing skills, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, actually, hang on a second. She made this. Cool. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, um... Is that She's the doll day? Just amazing. This doll is made out of wood, um, and it uses pieces of fabric that are kind of pressed into cracks in the wood. I'm not sure if you can see it. Um, yeah, but that's the side. Here's the back. Wow. This is a little bottom, and that's the bottom. Yeah. Anyway, so um, that was a wedding present from them from their family uh, for me and my husband. Um, and it was just like, I can't believe a watch on made that. You know, like, how do you do that? I think one of the things that that, that brings to my mind, actually, is the way that these, that crafts become not only um, occupations for people, but whole traditions that are passed down from generation to generation. Um, and that are not necessarily practiced, you know, they're not certainly not uh, taught in school, right? Uh, but you have these, but you have these sort of craft. You can have craft families, or you can have craft sort of schools, I guess. Um, not in a not in a academic school sort of way, but you know, the one tradition on this side of the town, and then the other tradition on this side of the town. Um, and those things can be lost, you know, if they're not passed down from person to person through apprenticeships and uh, other means. So, cloth dyeing is like that. Yeah. There are schools, though. Um, even, even now, there's. Um, 
they went to art school and there is there's not only just art school which will teach you most everything you've mentioned here today, but also um, there are schools that are like slightly more specialized art schools. Um, this one is like the California College of Arts and Crafts or something. Mm -hmm. Some girl I knew from high school. Yeah, I mean, I think I think at this point there are some schools. Yeah. yeah. My my original thought was coming out of um, coming out of Japan, where I'm not sure a lot of those things are like official schools, but I see your point. Yeah, there are art focused schools. Um, yeah. Even back in the day, you would go and you would apprentice. You know, I think also things like carpentry and stuff like that, I would include in, in, in this kind of uh, thing. Whereas, um, yeah, I'm not sure how how people teach carpentry here, but anyway. Um, well, school. furniture making is like Gap that. Gap in my knowledge. Some research. <laughs> yeah. Actually... That makes me think of um, Colonial Williamsburg, um, which is great because what they've done is not in addition to you know reconstructing the town the way it was in the 1700s, they also have all of the craftspeople working in the shops. You know, so they have the wig maker and the milliner and the the cobbler, and they have, um, you know, the furniture maker, and then they have the guy who builds houses, <laughs> you know, and they actually are having the fellow repair things in the town that need repairing in the way that they were repaired during that period. It's just, it's really cool. Like, you know, when I first <laughs> when I first went there, I thought, well, you know, this is great, you know, reenactments, I'm cool with that, whatever. But just the way that they have been so thorough about recreating all of these aspects of Williamsburg at that period, quite fascinating. Um, and one of my favorite things is to go into these crafts shops, you know, and, and see what people are doing there and uh, see how they're, See how they're working with these various different, uh, you know, tools that I've never seen before, <laughs> or tools that I've seen before but have never actually been in close proximity to. Um, I was thoroughly impressed when I went to. Um, oh shoot! What's the name of it? It was the guy who who makes windows and doors. Laser. Uh, no, it was not the glass maker. It was the guy who does the carpentry around. Uh, anyway. Oh, the framer. Yeah, sort of like that. But anyway, so um, the the tools he was using, you know, it would be so easy to lose a finger. <laughs> oh my gosh! You know, you have these these um, lathes and all kinds of these different tools, and they're all just sharp as knives, right? Um, it's uh, just uh, really impressive to watch people working with these things, you know. Um, I'm used to I'm used to having some power tools and and being really careful with them, <laughs> you know. But uh, but the way that you have to you know guide these things along, very 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 interesting. Um, yep. I'm writing notes. <laughs> oh, wait. Okay, did that help? That's a little louder, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm also just was too lazy to go dig up my headphones. So. <laughs> that's okay. I think you've actually gotten louder, so that's lovely. <laughs> I don't like having to go like this to hear Jay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I, like, okay, I did not know that thing was there. I don't, um, I'm not real good at computers. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's totally okay. Um, so, huh, let's see. Which crafts do you guys do? How about I ask that? 
I do. Well, I make jewelry. Sewing for dolls, and then I guess all my art would be considered a hobby since I make no money. So <laughs> drawing. Well, I mean, how do you make money is is immaterial. So you do you paint? What do you do? Watercolors mostly because they're cheap. <laughs> and black cool. and white. Um. I'm exceedingly uncrafty, but I have done some needlepoint and embroidery. Hmm. I make a lot of jewelry, necklaces, earrings, bracelets. Cool. Do you, do you, are you working with wire for that? or? It depends on what I'm making. Um, I use... I, I like to use elastic for bracelets because then I don't have to worry about the size. But mm. memory wire is handy for that because memory wire, you don't fasten at the ends depending on the design. Um, this time of year, I make a lot of gifts for Christmas. And uh, I was just <laughs> taking inventory last night on some of the beads I have. Uh, it's very therapeutic because you know, after a day at the keyboard, you want to give that part of your mind a rest. And so doing handwork with the, you know, sorting the colors, picking out the, the silk cord or the satin cord, whatever it is, uh, giving thought to the design, sketching the design maybe so you have the different ideas laid out in front of you, is mm -hmm. very helpful. I don't know how to put it in neurological terms, but I find it refreshing. Because that part gets done. You know, they say to ward off Alzheimer's, you're supposed to do those six things all the time to keep the mm -hmm. rust off. So I hope I'm, I'm covering my bases there. Yeah. People have said to me, now here's where it gets interesting. People have said to me, you ought to take your jewelry to consignment shops. You ought to sell, you know, online, Art, Fire, Etsy, blah, blah, blah. I don't want to mm -hmm. do that. For one thing, I don't have the time to maintain the inventory. And for another, mm -hmm. I don't want this to become work. And it would. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want this to remain a happy, pleasant activity that I do purely for pleasure and for giving presents to people I like. Uh -huh. You know, and to make it into an industry would rob it of its pleasure. I would like to make money on art. <laughs> I feel like <laughs> good. Oh my god. Right. Mm. Well, so um, do you want to do you want to mention anything, uh, Raj? Well, I was uh, I was. I worked with precious metals. I was a jeweler fabricating things, specialized in forging, and we mm -hmm. made it because I love stones so much. But I also, I paint. I don't know if you can see. Uh, if you can oh, get nice. bad Ooh. This is a, a scene from looking into the, the Himalayas. Uh, we're in Nepal right now. That's really, sorry, I can't give you a better image of that. But. Oh, that's good. Mm -hmm. That's really cool, Brad. And uh, that's the only painting I have in my studio. I've got very different kinds of paintings here and there. But that's just, you know, I also do not want to paint for a living because if I do that, I want it to be fun. So I'm exactly in the same place. Um, and uh, I gave up jewelry making for several reasons. One, the main thing is health. Um, all the materials, the, the solders are very toxic. Cadmium is the... Isn't it isn't a crucial ingredient in gold solders, and it's unless you've got a a seven thousand dollar exhaust system, um, it's wow. not safe to work with. Mm. Yeah. yeah, we haven't really talked about um, Mad Hatters and things like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Mercury is yeah. not your friend. <laughs> Mercury is definitely not your friend. Um, there are definitely hazards to certain kinds of uh, craft work. Um, and I've never actually figured out what the mercury was used for with hatting. Do you guys, any of, do you, do any of you guys know? Not it was part of processing the structure of the hat. Um, I think it had to do with, if it was leather you'd call it curing, but it helped shape the hat structure properly. Okay. Thanks for that. Yeah. I've been wondering for a while. I'm like, what is it for? <laughs> you know, why would you do this if it was gonna make you sick? 
Uh, maybe you wouldn't know that it was going to make you sick, but uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, there are tons of things that we haven't covered, like um, you know, baking bread and and um, you know, pâtisserie and all kinds of and all kinds of things. Um, I'm not sure where to go next, but one of the things that uh, that I've been thinking about is actually. Um, when we are writing stories, often our characters are really busy with plot. Um, and it, it's not necessarily, you don't necessarily see people engaging in normal everyday activities. Uh, yeah. Am I making sense here? Yes. That, that, yeah. that off screen people who are busy with plot don't necessarily have a lot of leisure time <laughs> so <laughs> I'm on a quest <laughs> hmm. uh, you know I can't stop in this village for two weeks to spin some fabric so I can patch my pants <laughs> <Just going to, laughs> this ring will not get to Mordor all by itself <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think it, but I think hobbies yes Jay, Jay says hobbies happen off screen and I think that ha that that's quite often the case but I think it's kind of fun when you can when you can show a little bit of the the ongoing day-to-day -day life stuff and some hobbies and crafts and 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 show the way people spend their their leisure time um yeah, you know. if it's not an intense, action-oriented story, you can always have your protagonist in his study doing whatever his hobby is when he's interrupted by mm -hmm. plot stuff happening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I must go and answer the plot. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me, I have a complication knocking at the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been, you know, I, I, I was working on that with, um, with Farin, and it was very, very challenging because I didn't know what people were allowed to do, you know. Um, and you got to figure that they do things with their free time. So I had my young people going to school, which is great, you know. Um, and but I'm thinking, what in the world can they do with themselves, right? Um, and so, and so, you know, my main character Tagra does not have to. He doesn't have to do anything with his free time. He doesn't have to do anything at all. He's you know got enough money that he has no idea how much money he even has. And you know, so what's he gonna do, right? And so I'm thinking, well, you know, does he? Does he go and, and, and ride around town in a, in a, on a skimmer, or does he, you know? Well, so for him, actually, what he does is he, he follows uh, concerts. He likes music, and he goes to concerts, um, you know. But, but that's kind of unusual among the nobility because, you know, hanging out with artists is a little, considered to be a little, you know, unusual, you know, bohemian behavior. <laughs> <laughs> um, but at the same time, so I think there are a lot of people probably hiding around the place doing things like, you know, embroidery, but not wanting to tell anyone because it's artisanal, right? Um, well, there's always but it, was, it was sort of funny trying to figure this out. And then, of course, by contrast, you look at the artisans and, the, and you know, the people who are who are supposed to be doing all these artistic things with their lives and they have another complete opposite problem where it's like what if I don't like doing this <laughs> you know? um, I mean they have obviously a lot of options uh, and more options than some other people do for what they're for what they're you know allowed to do because they can they can do all kinds of intellectual pursuits and you know whatever but um, yeah it was, it was very interesting trying to figure out what people did with their free time and uh, and so I had I, I I designed some games actually, so that people would have games that <laughs> that they played, so that it wasn't like okay when we have free time we sit around and doodle our thumbs, <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, so I.
Hello? Yep, somebody's frozen. Juliet's frozen. Now we can take over. Oh, dear. I don't recommend that. <laughs> oh, my God, I love TV. Oh, poor Julia. Oh, man. She's just stuck in time. Yep. She's in That's a loop. why I don't write that stuff. <laughs> I have... Uh, I'm back, I think. Ah. Okay. Well, you guys are... Yeah. Well, you're is a valuable thing. <laughs> but when it set up artifact becomes very problematic. I think it was mm -hmm. difficult to figure out how people you know and I keep their hand with themselves. Right? That's really good. Well, and also in this context, sports is a hobby. Mm -hmm. Either participating or watching. Yep. Can I ask a question? Why do people watch golf? <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. I think it must be very soothing, like kind of going fishing when you're just sitting there doing nothing, and <laughs> that's all I can say, I can think of. That's sort of maybe meditating announcers. <laughs> I mean, you know the ball's going to get into that hole eventually. There's see, the plot. <laughs> well, I don't know. It's possible that they're empathizing with the the state of focus that that the athlete is trying to achieve, right? I mean, yeah. And there's form. I don't know. Form is important. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. <laughs> People will bet on anything, though. <laughs> like, yes. will the ball in the hole? How long will it take? You know. I don't know. Can you picture the right game of golf? Of some Regency novel I read once upon a time where they said they'd even bet on which of two flies crawling up the window would, <laughs> yep. would reach the top first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, hobbies. Yeah, okay. Collecting things is a hobby. Yeah. I collect bookmarks. Yeah. Stamps. I don't know why that comes to mind. What did you say? Stamps. Oh, stamps. Stamps. Yep. Philately. Bugs. Mathematics. Um, Bugs. Yeah, the old the butterfly collection. Or fancy or, um. I think the only person I've ever had collect anything in a story of mine, he was a he was a murderer and was collecting <laughs> and he was collecting mementos of his victims. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Serial killer, there you go, great hobby. <laughs> ah, it's not precisely a hobby. No, I mean. <laughs> Well, and I was going to say bird watching, where you don't actually collect anything except ticking off on your list. Yeah. yeah. Birders yeah. get very enthusiastic about it. They get intense. Absolutely. Yeah. Have you seen that movie, A Big Year? Mm -mm. No. Um, so, guys, Steve, Steve Martin, Jack Black, and Owen Wilson are all birders. And they That's sort of funny take, right there. They, they take off, like, all this time and start spending all this money to, ha to go on what's called a big year, which is you try to see as many birds as possible that you can get to in one year. And Owen Wilson is, like, the current record holder with, like, 500-some birds. And so, of course, they, they keep meeting each other over and over and over at different locations. <laughs> and it's, it's an interesting sort of level of obsession. So it's like, when does hobby become more than hobby? Yeah. Um, like, Owen Wilson's marriage is pretty much over by the end of it. Um, huh. it's like, Jack Black has found a girlfriend who is also into birding. Um... 
And, and then Steve Martin sort of um, realizes he really does like to work and has sort of gone back as head of his company um, and things. So it's like they sort of all realize different things by the end of it. But um, uh, <laughs> That is interesting. Yeah. Um, I think I, there's two uh, crafts that are particularly interesting that because they keep developing, mm -hmm. one craft is uh, uh, glass blowing. Mm. Yeah, all sorts of new techniques that people are constantly inventing new things, and, and especially as new materials arise, you know, by, uh, you know, dichroic glasses allow all sorts of interesting things to happen, optically speaking. And, mm. uh, and the other one is pottery, which has, it's all this, these traditional elements, but then people can go in all these different directions. Are you aware of crystal glaze pottery? No. It, it's, a, it's an incredibly uh, time-consuming and difficult thing because what it is is that you put little zinc crystals on with, with certain kinds of uh, glazes uh, on your pottery and when you, when you fire it, if you time the temperature just right, it forms crystals. You know, sometimes big crystals, sometimes yeah. really interesting shape. It's very gorgeous, but you've got to monitor the temperature very precisely. And when you're dealing with, before you were dealing with gas kilns, and just dealing with wood, um, not so easy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I find it uh, interesting how how you know, over years and, and centuries, these things can become refined to such incredible degrees, you know, and and in Japan, you find that, that regionally, there, you know, there's, there's a particular pottery that comes from a particular region. Um, mm -hmm. So, we have some pottery that is from um, Unzen, which is this volcanic region in um, Kyushu and you know pottery connoisseurs would be able to look at it and say well that's unzen yaki right as opposed to say kiyomizu yaki which is also very very famous which comes from the region of the or surrounding the kiyomizu temple in Kyoto but like there are these you know secret techniques that are involved or you know ways that you recognize this that or the other one of the ways, actually, a great way to learn about this kind of stuff is to look at the um, Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. Because what you get in that context is you get uh, these experts who are looking at these objects and are able to tell you all these little details about how they were made that that you would never, ever think of otherwise. Um, so, yeah, if you're if you're interested in doing research on the kinds of things that matter about a particular object, that is it's just a sort of quirky but really great resource. One interesting thing is there's an area of crafts that is connected with religion more than any other that I can think of right now. I mean, aside from calligraphy uh, and certain kinds of religious paintings or religious, um, you know, artistic constructions like sand painting. For example, I'm what I'm holding up here, I don't know if you can see it, carving. Hold still. Yeah. Hold on for a second. Yeah. I don't know if that helped or made things. Hurt. This is 1,500 years old from Thailand, and it's oh, the wow. Buddha. And that's a really good example of, of a huge... Uh, concentration of energy that people do is, is to express their their religious beliefs or their spiritual oh. beliefs through some form of craft. Oh, I, think I have that's a temple it. charm from Thailand. It's about this big. Mm -hmm. um, it's Kuan Yin. And I was so excited to find it because I learned, as Juliet points out, the reason she's riding a water dragon is that's to whom she feeds the sorrows of the world. Yeah. You know, that's that's part that's the other end of the mercy equation. Mm -hmm. She feeds them to the water dragon. What the water dragon does with it, I have no idea. 
if there's some kind of uh, celestial alchemy or something going on, but it's that big and there's that much detail, and I'm just delighted to have it. In my book, uh, Opening Wonders, the um, basically Sarasvati shows up in a form, and she's riding her, her bird, which is a swan, but the swan in that particular book is the same swan uh, from The Ugly Duckling. Oh, cool. Cool. So, um, actually, you made me think, uh, Raj, of um, stonework, <laughs> because um, if you go to Europe and you see the cathedrals, those are projects of hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, dedication and incredible craftsmanship and just attention to detail you know the the carvings and the depictions of religious scenes and uh, you know the gargoyles the this that and the other you think about how long it takes for for an entire community to put together this incredible building um, that involves crafting and and some really interesting skills but not only that I mean it's 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 amazing to think how long it takes you know how much like how different would the skills that you use at the beginning of the construction you know be from the from the skills that you used at the end of construction because you you'd, you'd learn all this stuff while you were working on it over you know three four five hundred years I mean that kind of thing is fascinating to me, and I suppose it also counts as architecture. But, but yeah. um, too. some of that stonework is just amazing. Did you the things we call what reliefs. Oh, sorry, Glenda. I was just gonna say mosaics, tile mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have those mosaics that were just discovered in Turkey. Oh, yeah. Go yeah. look those up because those are pretty amazing. There's one of the nine muses that's just mind blowing in its quality, and you're like, how do you unearth that without wrecking it? Very, very carefully. Um, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Well, okay. So, um, what else is there? Anything else that we really should should um, address before before the end of the hour? Because we're coming close to the end of the hour. Um, uh, have you seen those uh, conch conch shells? There's a man in. It's part of Asia. I'm sorry, but he carves cameos into mm. the sides of the shells. And you know that's that's to me a work of art. I don't know if he considers it a hobby or not, but he can do little shells. He can do big shells. I hope he's teaching his children how to do this, because that's an art worth preserving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny, you know. I mean, these days you see all kinds of really amazing art just floating around on the internet. Yeah. And you think, well, people probably just consider this hobby, but at the same time, uh, it's amazing. So. Candle making. Mm hmm Yeah. Oh, I mean, gosh, making musical instruments. Yes. Mm -hmm. And of course, playing yeah. musical instruments. Yeah. And Actually. Have you guys ever seen um, Whisper of the Heart? Uh, yeah. Delightful movie, and I thought it was so interesting how one of the people there was like, he wanted to be a violin maker, and I was like, wow, <laughs> that is really an unusual aspiration for somebody to film. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, so I interesting. Like I sort of do stuff. I have one that I'm not working on, but it's it's about fashion and people learning it. And then it's it's interesting because I almost see better representations of like hobbies and children's books. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. 
because I guess they have time for it. They they mention it more. Flying kites is a good example there. Yeah, mm -hmm. kites. Well, there's um, there's one I'm reading called it's a whole series called Just Grace, and her neighbor and best friend Mimi loves crafting, and she makes um. She made these little stuffed animals at one point. She gets a book on how to make little stuffed animals, and she makes little stuffed animals. Yeah. Did you hear any of that? <laughs> I'm trying yeah, to I actually did. Mic. Okay. Well, you know, what's funny is there are all these different types of crafts that you can do, mm -hmm. right? I mean, tons and tons and tons of them. <laughs> It. I think if you walk into a crafting store, it gives you a picture, but it doesn't even start to give you the whole picture. There's so many different things that you can do. I mean, I just I just made a little pom pom birdie with my daughter last night, and you know, took it to she took it to class to give to her teacher, and her teacher was like, oh, "Wow, you know, <laughs> we we made this in school when I was a little kid," and I was like. You know, wow, this is really fun. So I remembered how to do it. But now, you know, I I saw the look on the teacher's face, and I'm like, I, you know, I'd be happy to come in and teach the kids how to make these. And she's like, oh, that's a great idea. I'm like, wow, you know, you never. It's not, yeah, they. What I love is the way that you can sometimes take things, little things like crafts have an interesting significance that changes things. And, that was a way that just something that I hardly thought anything of made a difference in the life of the teacher and she wants to have me come in help the kids learn how to do this. It'd be interesting to see that used for social purposes in a story also. Actually that just reminded me of something from my childhood which ties into gendered crafts. This was mm. in elementary school many, many decades ago, and mm -hmm. when the weather wasn't nice enough to go outside for recess this one year, the teacher, the girls got to sew doll clothes, mm. and the boys carved soap with pocket knives. Mm. And I was so mad because I wanted to carve soap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. But that certainly could be a, a factor in a story. You know, Absolutely. some crafts are very gendered in some yeah. cases. And I'm sure that there's like a whole subtopic we could plumb there, but we don't have time. <laughs> so you will have to go forth and have further discussions about this on your own. <laughs> Um, but thank you so much for bringing it up because I'm definitely going to make sure I mention that in my report. I mean, part of, part of the whole point of doing this and having the reports is getting ideas that then can can get people to go off and and, and have, spark their own discussions and ideas. And so, um, yeah, thanks, thanks, you guys. Um, we're about at the end of our hour, so thanks to all of you for your contributions. Um, let's see, next week. Is Thanksgiving. It's looking like Thanksgiving. <laughs> well, um, so so the question is, do we want to have a hangout the day before Thanksgiving? I'm game. Um, my kids won't be in school, though. Mm. I'm up for it if you want to. Well, would it be on Tuesday? It would be on Wednesday. Wednesday, okay. Yeah, because um, I'm happy with the Wednesday yeah. Um, it's not a great day for me, but well, in that particular case, yeah, there there are advantages uh, advantages to it for me, and I'm sorry, there to some degree, I kind of have to just go with what's optimal for my schedule, given that I, that I have kids in school and, and various things. Um, however. How about how about we try a meeting next week on Wednesday at three and uh, see how we go? And I may have kids popping in and out. Let's see. Um, why don't we talk talk about uh, 
diversity. That was something okay. I mentioned. Um, that should be fun. All right, so I will um, go off the air. I usually, you know, I like to talk about what we're going to do next week before I go off the air so people who watch can go, oh, perhaps I should get involved next week. Anyway, thanks to everybody for coming, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>